This is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on him is not condemned. But he who believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we begin our study of the word this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we come to study your word. We come to be encouraged and strengthened and edified by an understanding of who you are and who we are. It is through your word that we come to understand the necessity of the plan of salvation. We come to understand that there is nothing that we can do, nothing that we can bring to you, nothing that we can offer that can uh, counter the tremendous impact of sin in the human race that sin has rendered everyone in the human race spiritually dead, and that there is no cure for that other than the cross of Christ. There's no way that we can ever pay the penalty on our own other than through eternal spiritual death. But yet, Jesus Christ in his death on the cross solved that problem. He provided a perfect salvation for us. And in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and his ascension to heaven, a new organism came into existence, the church. And this church, of which we are a part, is unique and significant. And the role that we have to play in history, uh, now and in the future, is unique and distinct And we learn so much about it from the Word, and it encourages us to put our focus not on the details of life and the here and the now, but on the future and what we're being prepared for and how that fits within your your future plans and purposes for the human race. Now, Father, as we study today, we pray that our focus might be on Jesus Christ and all that he has provided for us and that we may understand this relationship in an even greater, deeper level. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. We're in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. The last couple of weeks we focused on what Paul is developing in these verses, beginning back in verse, uh, back with verse 15, talking about Jesus Christ as the only one who is truly sufficient because he alone is fully God and fully man. And we'll see in, as Paul develops his discourse here that, that Jesus is not just a man. Jesus is fully God. He is the one who created all things. And as the creator, he knows all things. Nothing is beyond his knowledge. Nothing is beyond his ability to uh, understand, to control. No problem is too great for him because he is God. He is the creator and the sustainer of all things. But beyond that, in this age, in this church age, for those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, who comprise the church, what we call the universal church, the body of Christ, which is composed of all believers of all the ages, those of us who are members of the body of Christ have a different relationship to Jesus than that which had gone before the cross, And we are members of his body in a unique way, the scripture teaches, and he is the head of the body. And I began to focus on this uh, last time. We talked about the sufficiency of Christ, the necessity of Christ, and the authority of Christ over the church. And these are all interconnected. You cannot have sufficiency in Christ without understanding It's necessity that only Christ is sufficient, and 
he is necessary. You can't have that su- that sufficiency any other way. And that is connected to his authority. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. This is such a grand statement. There's so much here that I want to develop a few more connections here so that we can come to understand what follows in a more profound way. Last time I focused on this key word that we have here, the word that he is the head of the body. It is borrowing from the physical uh, relationship of the head, the location of the brain, as the command and control center for the body, and relating that to this spiritual organism, this spiritual entity that came into existence on the day of Pentecost in A.D. 33, that this new body, the church, has an authority structure. And the head of the body, the authority over the body, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And this word head, from the Greek kephale, means, in a metaphorical sense, means superiority or authority. It emphasizes uh, authority, leadership, and that it is Jesus Christ who is the head of the body. So I pointed out last time that uh, there's some conflict today because of some of the ways that authority is looked at, that this really doesn't mean authority. It, it has to do, especially in the relationship of men and women, husbands and wives, it has the idea of origin as the woman came from the side of Adam. However, as I pointed out last time, uh, and I didn't emphasize this one point, that when you have this word head in Greek, in either classic Greek or Koine Greek, in the singular, which is how it is always used in the Scripture, it's never used in a plural form as it is in that quote I used last time from Herodotus, the, the headwaters uh, of a river, that's uh, plural. But when it's used for authority, it's always in the singular, and it is never used of anything else uh, in the singular. It's never used of uh, origin or source. So it always refers to to authority. So I pointed out that the meaning of this metaphor is related to authority, and headship teaches the idea of authority, the command and control concept borrowed from the uh, image of a body. Thus, we saw that headship in these various passages, we looked at Ephesians 5 and 1 Corinthians 11, that it emphasizes the authority of Jesus Christ over the church, and that we are to submit to his authority, and his authority is expressed through the word which the Apostle Paul describes as the mind of Christ, the thinking of Christ, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. And that this authority relationship of Christ to the church is then a, a, a basis for understanding all authority structure, but it is specifically applied in Scripture to the relationship of men to women and headship within, uh, especially authority structure within marriage. And so we looked at Ephesians chapter 5, which we will look at again today to pull out a few more uh, observations. But before we go there, I want to look at four different ways in which we see the headship or the authority of Christ uh, talked about in the New Testament. The first has to do with a dispensational orientation. Now, what do I mean when I use that word dispensational? It comes from a Greek word, oikonomia, which has to do with uh, the economy or really the administration of God's plan in history, how God oversees history in the human race, and that God has a plan and purpose, and that there are different times and epochs and eras in human history with distinct characteristics that belong to each of these time periods. Just as a simple illustration, in the Old Testament uh, period, in the dispensation related to uh, Israel, related to the Mosaic Law, the people of God were the Jews. God called out the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he said that through them all the world would be blessed. Now we know that that blessing came through several different ways. One of the ways was through 
the, that they were the custodians of Scripture. It was through the Jewish people that the Word of God, that the Scriptures were given through the prophets of Israel, and the Scriptures were recorded and were maintained and preserved down through the centuries. Another way in which all the world was blessed was that it would be through the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then it was narrowed down to the tribe of Judah, and then even further to the descendant of King David, that the Messiah would come, the one who would come, as Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 53, that he would take upon himself our iniquity. He would bear in his body our sins, and that this was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so uh, there's a dispensational difference there from the Old Testament, that there's a looking forward to the fulfillment of that promise, of the Messiah, and that until that came, there would be these sacrifices, animal sacrifices that would depict the very nature of the kind of thing that would be necessary to pay for the penalty of sin. That sin is a horrible thing, and so for uh, sin to be taken care of inside of God, uh, death was the penalty, so there had to be a death. And so there was a picture of this in the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, and it required a special kind of sacrifice. There was a lamb, a lamb that was taken from the flock that was first uh, observed to make sure that it truly was without spot or blemish, that this lamb was really picturing something, and that is that the ultimate sacrifice, the one who uh, would pay the penalty for sin, would have to be sinless himself without moral spot or blemish. And so there's this picture that you have all through the Old Testament with the sacrificial system that looks forward to a future final sacrifice. But after Christ came, we no longer sacrifice at the temple. We don't go to God on the basis of an animal sacrifice because the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world has come and he has paid that penalty. So at the very basic level in terms of understanding God's administration of history, if you're not going to uh, the temple, you're not going to God on the basis of an animal sacrifice, then you understand that something changed in the way God administered history from the Old Testament uh, to the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God focused on Israel as his people. But because they rejected Jesus as Savior, they were removed from the land just as they had been in the Old Testament in uh, 722 B.C. and 586 B.C. And God has temporarily uh, put the emphasis on a new people of God composed of both Jew and Gentile who are now as uh, our passage that I read this morning in Ephesians 2 emphasizes, we are now uh, united in one body. The barrier that divided Jew and Gentile has been removed. And so when Jesus came, he came first to offer himself to Israel as the Messiah, and he was rejected. So these two passages that I have up here on the screen related to Christ dispensationally is he came to be that head, that word for cornerstone is really the chief cornerstone or head cornerstone, literally in the Greek. It uses kephale. He was to have been the chief or head cornerstone for Israel at his first coming, and he will be at his second coming when he establishes his kingdom. This is the thrust of Acts chapter 4, verse 11, as well as 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. Both of those verses refer to him and that historical role in relationship to Israel. Second way in which Jesus has this authority is over the uh, human race in terms of humanity and a chain of command structure, chain of leadership structure, I like to say, is that Christ is the head of every man. And that's not man in terms of humanity, in terms of mankind, but that's man in terms of male. It is the Greek, not the Greek word anthropos there, but the Greek word aner, which emphasizes male, that he is the head of every man. 1 Corinthians verse, chapter 11, verse 3, which we studied last time. Third, we see an ecclesiological headship or authority as in the passage we're studying, Christ is the head of the church, which is referred to as the bride of Christ. 
And then fourth, there is a universal or cosmic authority that Jesus has, that he is the head over all principalities and powers and authorities. Uh, He has a universal lordship and authority, as we see in Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. A couple of other verses that emphasize these different headships, the two most important, his headship over the church and over all things in the universe. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, that, that refers to God the Father. He, that is God the Father, put all things under his feet. That is a picture of authority. And gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It is that concept of Christ as the head of the church and the concept of the body that I'm focusing on this morning. Colossians 2.10 says that we're complete in him, and he is then defined as the one who is the head or the authority over all principality and power. This covers all visible and invisible life, all sentient life, all angels, demons, all human beings are under the authority of Jesus Christ. So Colossians 1.18 says that he is the head, the authority of the body, the church, And then it says, who, that is, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Now, the word for beginning is a little bit misunderstood here. It's a Greek word, arche, which not only has the idea of beginning or first in a series of events, but it also has the idea of originating cause. And this is talking about Christ as the one who is not only the head of the body, but he is the one who originates the body of the church. And that come, the church is born from his death on the cross. There's no church before A.D. 33. Now, sometimes you will run into various other uh, Christian organizations, groups, denominations, theological positions that will teach that. They will say that Israel is the church in the Old Testament, and that the church is in the New Testament is spiritual Israel. Now, there's a name for this kind of teaching. It's called replacement theology. Replacement theology. And replacement theology is what, it's, what the term says. It replaces Israel completely, totally, in God's plan, with the church. And in replacement theology, they only see one people of God, and so they read back into the Old Testament, New Testament teaching on the church, and they will talk about Adam being the first uh, Christian, and Abraham as a Christian. They read these things back so that they obliterate the distinction between Israel and the church. Now, one of the unintended evil consequences of replacement theology as it worked itself out historically was anti-Semitism. And in replacement theology, now not not everybody who believes that is into anti-Semitism. I'm just saying that, that replacement theology is the soil that is perfectly fertilized to produce the thorns and the weeds of anti-Semitism. It doesn't always produce that, but uh, that's what it has come out of. It is out of Christianity, unfortunately, this form of Christianity that we see the rise of of anti-Semitism down through history because uh, the Jewish people were blamed individually as the Christ killers, as those who uh, rejected Jesus and killed him, and therefore they're under a curse of God. They are no longer uh, God's people. All of the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, etc. in the Old Testament have been completely removed and given, uh, given to the church. And so as a result of that, there was a rationale that developed that it was the role of Christians to punish Uh, punish Jews and that they were no longer God's people. That's the rise of anti-Semitism. And it came out of, and part of the basis for that rationalization was this idea of replacement theology, that the church replaced Israel and that uh, there was no longer any value or significance to Israel. One of the byproducts of that kind of thinking today is uh, an anti-Zionism. 
uh, a position of anti-Israel. Well, Israel really doesn't matter. They're, you know, they're Jews, and they once were God's people, and we can be grateful for the fact that they gave us the word of God, and Jesus was Jewish, but, but they rejected him, so God no longer has a special place or plan or future for Israel. And there are many within denominations that hold to forms of covenant theology. Uh, usually that's found in Presbyterian churches of that type, those that are influenced by uh, Calvinism, and that they take that particular view. Now, what's interesting is that may be the view of the theology of the men in the pulpit, but often uh, one of the little-known uh, things that Presbyte- uh, the conservative Presbyterians, like the Presbyterian Church in America, doesn't really want people to know is that a third of their pastors are premillennial. So... Uh, you always find these little things happen because there are those who read the scriptures and they and they sit in the pew and they say, well, uh, it just seems to me God still values Israel. So just because they have that kind of a theological foundation doesn't mean they're consistent with it. So uh, don't don't automatically assume that because somebody's Presbyterian or Calvinist that they're uh, anti-Zionist or anti-Semitic. But that the other thing that we see with the term replacement theology today is that those who hold to it don't want to be given that label. Oh, no, 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 we don't believe in replacement theology. Replacement theology is redefined by them as that view of the Jews that led to the Holocaust. And they don't want to be associated with that, so they say, no, we don't believe in replacement theology. The Pope has said that replacement theology is a terrible evil, and we no longer believe it. Then he turns around and says, now, Jews, you can't refer to yourself as a chosen people anymore. Well, wait a minute, wait, which is it? You, believe, you, believe in, you don't believe in replacement theology, or you do? Because if the Jews aren't the chosen people, then that's replacement theology. I don't care what label you put on it. And so there are those kinds of semantic games that come along, which raises the question, is it anti-semanticism or anti-Semitism? Now, what Paul says here is that there is a new organism that comes into existence in A.D. 33. And as we see, there's nothing anti-Semitic or anti-Israel about it. We've seen that in our study in Acts on Tuesday night, in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3. And and that really for the first uh, 15 to 20 years or so of the church, it was almost exclusively made up of Jewish believers in Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. And it wasn't until sometime towards the end of the 40s and into the early 50s that you have Paul beginning to take the gospel uh, to the Gentiles as there was less and less of an acceptance of Jesus as Messiah uh, among the Jewish people. And so Jesus is seen here in... Uh, verse 18, as the beginning. The beginning wasn't with Adam. The beginning wasn't with Abraham. The beginning of the church was with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. When the church is established, when he sends the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in A.D. 33. And there's the connection is made here by the next phrase, which is a, just an explanation, an appositional explanation of the term beginning, the firstborn from the dead. We've already run into this word um, <clears throat> in verse 15, where we read, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And I pointed out that this word, firstborn from the Greek prototakos, can mean first in priority or first in time. And Paul uses it both ways here because Jesus is first in priority over all creation, the preeminent one, because he is also eternally God. This is what Paul uh, says uh, later on when we, will, when we get down into um, the uh, second uh, chapter of, of uh, Colossians, that in Christ dwells the fullness of deity bodily. He has every aspect of deity uh, 
uh, which means he has eternal life. He is eternal. He is infinite. So he is fully God. So he is first born over creation, not because he has a beginning either in time or a beginning in eternity past, but because he is the preeminent one over all creation. But here, as a human being, who has, as one who entered into human history through the hypostatic union, the joining the union of full deity and true humanity through the virgin birth, that Jesus it becomes the firstborn in time. He is, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, the first fruits of resurrection, so that none received a resurrection body before he. It is his resurrection that is the first fruits that is the first of all those who believe in him, Old Testament believers, New Testament believers. It is not until he receives his resurrection body that others do. And so uh, he is the firstborn from the dead, the first to be resurrected from the dead. And it is that that begins, uh, lays the foundation for the beginning of the church. So that establishes one of those distinctions between uh, Old Testament dispensation and the church age. So he is the first in time in, re- in terms of resurrection. This is the same idea, the same phrase that is used in Revelation 1.5, uh, referring to Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. There is a cause-effect relationship here that because he is the firstborn from the dead and be- God glorified him and He is in heaven, and he will be given as the Son of Man the authority to rule over the kings of the earth. Now, Colossians 1.18 goes on to say that the purpose in God's plan for Jesus is that he may have preeminence in all things. That last phrase there, the last clause, the purpose clause, is that the reason he's the head of the church The beginning, the firstborn of the dead, all focuses towards the end game that he, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And this is the Greek word uh, protuo, which means to have the highest rank in a group. Now let's think about this a minute. Jesus in his humanity, I mean in his deity, Jesus in his deity is fully God. As uh, Paul outlined in verses verse 16 and 17, he created all things. They were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. In his deity, Jesus is over everything. Jesus is equal to God in his per- God the Father in his person, and he is distinct from God as a person. This is the doctrine of the Trinity. You have one essence in the triune God and three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But when Jesus entered into human history through the incarnation, when he added to his full divine nature true humanity, he had a purpose and a plan, and that was to fulfill God's original purpose and plan for the human race. Adam was faced with the test, and Adam disobeyed God and failed. Jesus is coming along as the second Adam, created, as, born as Adam was created without sin. And Jesus, unlike Adam, will pass all of the tests, and he will not sin. And so in his humanity, Jesus is going to gain what he had already in his deity. And this is what the writer of Hebrews emphasizes it through, through the first chapter of Hebrews, is that Jesus is elevated to the right hand of God the Father on the basis of what he achieves in his humanity and what he accomplishes in his humanity so that the person who is sitting at the right hand of God the Father in heaven is sitting because he is true humanity. In his deity, he's omnipresent. But in his humanity, he is localized, and he is seated at the right hand of God the Father in a position where he is waiting for the Father to give him the kingdom. And he will give it to him according to Daniel chapter 7 when 
he returns to the earth not as the Son of God, but as the Son of Man. And the Son of Man comes to conquer the kingdoms of man to establish his kingdom on the earth. And so it is through his death, burial, and resurrection, his ascension, glorification at the right hand of God the Father, his elevation above the angels at that point. He was created a little lower than the angels, the psalmist said, and now he is higher than the angels in his humanity. He always was in his deity, in his humanity, so that he becomes the preeminent one, the God-man, and that hypostatic union of humanity and deity never goes away. For all eternity, he is joined with humanity, and he rules. So this is the idea here that Paul is bringing on just these short phrases, he, that he may have the preeminence and rule over all things when he comes in his kingdom. And so all of this is tied together in this concept of his, of his headship. Now, last time as I developed the thinking in the Scripture about his, uh, his headship, his authority, I pointed out that we often have a problem understanding authority in uh, our human experience. That is because many who have positions and offices of authority abuse that authority. They do so because they are sinners and they are, have a trend towards some form of corruption or self-absorption or whatever. And no matter how great a man may be, he's a man or a woman in a position of leadership and they have flaws and failures. We too often see this splashed across the front pages of newspapers or People Magazine or Us Magazine or, for those of you who don't look at the higher forms of cultural literature, the National Examiner or whatever, the Midnight Globe, and there we learn everybody has flaws and failures, every one of us, that even the very best leaders we can point to are human beings and have a sin nature and they're corrupt. And that's one of the things that gets pointed out again and again and again through the Old Testament that God points out for us is no matter how much a leader loves God, you have David, you have Solomon, they have great flaws and great failures. And it's to show that that when it's all said and done, we can't fulfill what God intended us to fulfill. Our leaders can't be the kind of leaders we think they ought to be because of these flaws. Isn't it interesting that we live in a culture today that is so libertine, so licentious, that we, we think that there really shouldn't be any of these standards. We're going to legitimize homosexuality. We legitimize all kinds of behavior. But then as soon as some leader gets involved in some s- scandalous affair, the first thing we do is we go, <gasps> how can they do that? There is something, it seems, at the very core of our soul that recognizes that that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it is, and too often we overreact in this kind of hypocritical uh, self-righteousness. But at the core of all that, whether you want to believe in absolutes or God or not, even the most atheist, relativistic person always betrays this, this God consciousness and this knowledge of God because when they see something like that happen, they say, that's not right. That's not how it ought to be. And that betrays this fact that we know there's a high standard that should be met and none of us ever, ever makes it. And there's always this distortion with authority. So we go through trends and we go through cycles where we become anti-authoritarian. And in, as paganism and relativism takes hold of the human mind and thought process, we, we go against authority. We become anti-authoritarian. And that is because the authorities that we see are abusing authority and leadership in their position. And so we confuse the office with the person who holds the office. And so we forget that authority is good, but the individual who has the office may be evil, may be abusive, may be tyrannical, may be irresponsible. But the office and the reality of authority is 
is true and good and perfect because you even have authority within the Godhead. And so I want to go back to under, say a few more things about this concept as it relates to Jesus as the head of the church. So let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 is a passage that is focusing on on the spiritual life and the spiritual walk, and it comes to a conclusion in the last part of the chapter where through a series of participles coming out of the command to be filled by means of the Spirit in 518, uh, Paul is describing the characteristics of the person who has been filled by means of the Spirit and grows to maturity. And in that growth to maturity, there are certain things that should characterize that person's life. He is going to be characterized first and foremost by worship. Isn't that interesting? In verse 19, the first consequence of being filled by means of the Spirit is speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Every now and then I run into people who say, you know, why do we sing in church? Why don't we ju- if, if the whole point is to study the Word, why don't we just go right there? Well, that's because you have a very, very wrong view of church and worship. Because we don't just go there, because the first thing that we're supposed to do that's an evidence of of the filling of the Spirit is singing to God in praise and hymns, and these are very important to think about what it is that we're singing and wonder what was going on in the mind of the person who wrote that when they wrote that. And I've gone through times like that. I was thinking about that as the choir sang uh, this morning and uh, just thinking about... uh, All that we think about in terms of who Jesus is and that he is everything to me. Why? What does that mean in my own life? So we should think about these things when we're singing those those great hymns because they are to focus they're designed to focus our thinking on these great timeless truths of Christianity. So one of the first results of a person who is walking by the Spirit is is singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And that isn't talking about the fact that, oh, I'm just singing in my heart. I'm not going to sing out loud. It's talking about the fact that it's not just that you're singing out loud, but that singing out loud reflects an inner reality. It's not just an outer thing. There's an inner thing going on. It's not saying, oh, you can just sing in your heart and just sit there and look at your hymnal and keep your mouth shut. I know some of you do that. I'm just tweaking you a little bit. You've got to grow a little bit, get out of the diapers, grow up, and uh, recognize that this is part of your spiritual life. And it's an important part, otherwise it wouldn't be first. Then the next thing is giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So developing an attitude of gratefulness, thinking about all that we have is coming from the Lord. And then submitting to one another in the fear of God. Notice it's the first thing that is said there is this mutual submission. That flows out of humility. God doesn't say first and foremost there's a chain of command. Make sure you never go outside the chain of command. First thing he says is there's a mutual submission and respect for one another in the body of Christ. Then having said that in terms of the universal body, he says, now within certain other areas of our experience, there are certain authority structures. Wives are to submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And I pointed out last time that I think one of the hard things for uh, many wives to recognize is that their submission to the authority of their husband is a barometer of their submission to the authority of Christ. So just, ladies, just take a look at how you respond to your husband's authority, and that's how you really respond to the authority of Christ. There's the, that's what Paul said. It's not my opinion. It's the Holy Spirit. And then Paul says, for the husband is the head of the wife. He's the authority that God sets up in the home, now, as Christ is the head of the church. If you want to knock the whole doctrine of the authority of Christ in the, in the home... I mean, the authority of the husband, the male in the home, then you have to attack the authority of Christ over the church. That's why I always say that that this whole issue of authority in the home and what came out of the, the feminism of the 1960s, 
is a theological blasphemy. You never talk about it that way. But if what the radical feminists say about authority in the home is true, then Christ is evil. And the authority of Christ over the church is evil. And also there just can't be a trinity either. Because in the trinity, Christ is equal to God the Father, but the God the Father is the authority over Christ. So if authority of one person over another indicates that one is a subservient being, then Christ cannot be equal to the Father. So it, it, it's a direct assault on the foundational doctrines of Christianity. Now this, this leadership and authority of the husband, as I pointed out last time, isn't a tyrannical thing. That's how it's been distorted and abused by sinful, self-centered, arrogant men. Women are to, uh, the men are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. That is equally challenging and difficult for men. And then after uh, reminding the men of their responsibility to love their wives as Christ loved the church, he goes on to talk about this relationship between Christ and the church because there is something in that relationship between Christ and the church that is abstract, that is difficult for us to get our mental hands around. And so Paul uses this analogy of the way a husband and wife should be together as to help us to understand how Christ and the church uh, relate. And so he comes down to verse 28, talking to the husbands, and he says, So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Now, there's always the liberal crowd that comes along and says that, that see, Paul was a misogynist. He just hated women. He, that's all he's about here is he's just dumping on women. Women have to be in this subservient role. And you always hear the uh, liberal Protestant denominations and others uh, misconstrue Paul that way. If, and they'll say, you know, Paul's just a product of his culture. If Paul was a product of the misogynist Greek culture, he would never say what he says in verse 28. This is revolutionary. You know, what, what he says in terms of husband loving your wi- wives as Christ loved the church is radical in that world. He didn't get that from the culture. So you can't say, well, he got the thing about women from the culture, but here, oh, this is wonderful. Now, you, you, you know, the Bible has to all be true or none of it's true. It all has to hang together. You have to interpret it in, in light of, at least assume that whoever wrote this had two brain cells that were uh, occasionally uh, in connection with one another, and they weren't writing something that was contradictory. So he, he's going to help husbands figure out what it means to love your wife. He says, Husbands ought to love your wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. So again, I want to remind you of what I said last time, that authority and headship in the Scripture is never disconnected from true love, from virtue love, from love that has integrity. You can't separate leadership from love. You cannot. Leadership without love is tyranny. And that's what the Scripture says. Every time you get into passages that deal with the headship, there's, it always comes back to love. And that's what, what Paul is saying. Here. Yes, husbands, you are the leader in the home, and that means you, what? You love your wife as Christ loved the church. How's that? You love your uh, wife as your own body. And then he gives an explanation so you understand what this means, and that's indicated from the grammar by that first word, for. He says, no one ever hated his own flesh. And this is expressed as a universal principle. No one ever hates his own flesh. Even the person who says, oh, I'm such a loser. No, I've got such a bad self-image. The only reason he's upset that he has a bad self-image is because below that he has a really good self-image. And he's just uh, upset with himself for not meeting up to his own uh, unrealistic expectations because of his overbloated self-love. So no, Paul says, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Now, the Lord's relationship to the church in this passage is all about headship and authority, 
And that headship and authority is expressed by these two verbs, to nourish and to cherish. The first verb is the Greek word ektrepho. It's a present active indicative indicating this is a continuous action. This is a, an ongoing characteristic of Christ's authority and relation to the church. Uh, it's, a, a, there, it's a gnomic present which expresses a timeless truth. It means to nourish. It means to promote health and strength. And uh, it's used again in this passage in chapter 6 when it's talking about uh, fathers are to uh, bring up the children in the training of the and admonition of the Lord. It has to do with instruction as well. So that's part of promoting health. So no one ever hates his own felt own flesh, but he nourishes, that is, he promotes health and strength, does what is necessary to produce strength and growth and health in the object of love. And the second verb there, cherish, is the Greek word thalpo, which uh, has its core meaning is to warm something. And from that literal meaning, it picked up a a metaphorical meaning at looking at a, a mother bird Uh, incubating those eggs, hovering over, keeping those eggs warm in the nest. And so metaphorically it came to depict the idea of caring for uh, someone, comforting someone, uh, has the idea of brooding over, and we have brought that idiom over as when you're really focused and you on something, you care about it a lot, you just think about it a lot, and you focus on it, and so we say they're brooding over it. And so that's the idea here, that that uh, you love someone, you nourish and cherish them, you seek their, uh, what is, promotes their health, their strength, and their comfort. So Paul says that uh, this is the essence of, of that love relationship, just as the Lord does it to the church. That's the relation of the head to the body, is nourish and cherish. And then he goes on in terms of developing this analogy, he says, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Now that's another difficult thing for us to get our thinking around, is that we are members of his body, but it's a spiritual body. It is not a material body. Uh, We're members of that, and so his use of flesh and bones here is not talking about it in terms of it's using the analogy of a physical body to express a spiritual truth. Paul also does this in passages, especially like in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, Paul says, For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Now, there's two ideas that are present here. One is there's a universal body, and the emphasis is on unity. But at the other hand, the emphasis is also on the distinction among the members of the body. Now, that's what's interesting about Christianity, and you can only get it from a plural concept of the Trinity. In the Trinity, think about this. This this will blow your mind, give you some talk about at lunch today. The Trinity says that God is one. He is a unity. But he's also three. There are three distinct individuals so that the whole has value and the parts have value and the whole is not more valuable than the parts and the parts are more valuable than the whole. Now, that has a lot of application, and one is to marriage. This is what Paul says, we submit to one another. That emphasizes unity, but in the midst of that unity, there's also a role or authority distinctions. The husband is the head of the wife, and the wife is submit to the husband. The husband's to love the wife. The parents are in authority over the children, so the parts have significance. Now, this, has, this is important in terms of understanding culture and government. And only in countries that have had a profound impact of biblical thought from, and truly theologians and Christian thinkers thought these things out centuries ago, even if you haven't ever heard of this. It's a very old concept. And they understood that if you applied this to government and to culture, it meant that every person... Because every person is created in the image and likeness of God. Every person has equal value and significance. But they're also part of a whole. 
And so you can emphasize the whole without sacrificing individuality, and you can emphasize the individual without sacrificing the whole. And that has given rise to the kind of culture you see, you have seen at the high watermark of Britain and mostly the English-speaking peoples, because that was the high watermark of Protestant theology. And it produces a gover- a, a, the kind of government and culture where the government is limited because if you ha- the bigger the government gets, the less value the individual parts have. But if you put too much emphasis on the individual parts, which happens in various forms of libertarianism, then you lose the significance of the whole and you end up in anarchy. So only coming out of a scriptural viewpoint where you can, can, can recognize the wholeness and the distinctiveness of the entity can you really have value for each part. You, men can respect women as equal image bearers. And women can respect men as equal image bearers, but still recognize an an authority structure that doesn't minimize and diminish the equality aspect. Are you going to get that out of Islam? Never. Because you just have a God, your ultimate reality is a Unitarian monotheism. So millions and billions of years ago, all you had was this singular entity, Allah. And when he creates, all you have is a a rigorous, straight-down authority structure. The only thing that's significant is the whole, and you don't have a significance or emphasis on the value of the parts. And so you're never going to be able to develop any kind of democracy in in countries that are dominated by Islamic thought. You're never going to solve the problem in, in the marriage, in the, in the relation between men and women under Islam, because they have no ultimate religious or philosophical framework for valuing the individual. All they have is a, is a hierarchy of authority that promotes tyranny. You'll never have it happen. So what we watch, because of the biblical ignorance of government leaders and their religious ignorance of government leaders is it, from, you know, every president we've had for the last 20 years is they're trying to promote democracy in a culture that can never, ever understand dem- It isn't in their DNA. It's not in their intellectual, philosophical, or religious DNA, and you can't insert it with an injection. It's not there. And so all of these ideas of headship and authority and how you understand the role of Christ and the church and your individual relation to his authority, all of this is interconnected. And it impacts marriage, it impacts government, it impacts anything that relates to an authority structure. So in 1 Corinthians 12.12, the emphasis on the whole and on the individual Verse 14 says, for the body is not one member, but many. There's the emphasis on the whole. And then verse 20 says, but now there are many, are they many members, yet one body? See the emphasis on the individuals and the emphasis on the whole. It's not either or, it's both and. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. See, there's that value for each person. No person has more value, more significance than another. But what's interesting is this word care that we have here is the verb, the Greek verb merimnao, which is the same verb used over in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, where it says, be anxious for nothing. So you can have a negative sense or a positive sense. Here it's the positive sense of care and concern for someone. It's that that mother bird brooding and caring for her young. So here, uh, the emphasis is on the members who should have this kind of care and concern for one another. <clears throat> Ephesians four twenty five, Paul says, gives a command, then he concludes by saying, for we are members of one another. There's this interconnectedness among members of the body of Christ. Now, going back to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5.31 says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. It's a quote from Genesis 2.24. And often you 
go to that passage and, and you'll stop and talk about marriage. This isn't talking about marriage in this passage. Um, just as a side note, the word there for, uh, the two sh- uh, for be joined to his wife is the Greek word proskalao, which means to just join something. It's used in uh, Psalm 22.15 in the Septuagint when uh, uh, it says, My tongue will cleave or join or stick to the roof of my mouth. Luke 10.11, Jesus talks about dust clinging to sandals. And the uh, prodigal son, the prodigal son joins himself to the foreign citizens. In Acts 8.29, Philip joins the Ethiopian eunuch up in his chariot. It just means to come together into a, a unity. But Ephesians 5.31 fits within a thought flow. Ephesians 5.29 is talking about the Lord's authority to the church as nourishing and cherishing it. Verse 31 is using a human institution to illustrate that joining of man and woman. And then in verse 32, Paul comes back and says, this is a great mystery. What's the great mystery that husbands... that, that Husbands and wives are to leave their father and mother and become one flesh? Is that a mystery? Not since Genesis 2.24. So what's the mystery? The mystery is understanding how Jesus, as the head of the church, is going to nourish and cherish the church. Ideally, in Genesis 2.24 and in the marriage union before the fall, there's that nourish and cherishing taking place between the husband and the wife. Now, when Paul says this is a great mystery, mystery we know, as we've studied this before, is a previously unrevealed doctrine. Well, marriage has been revealed since Genesis 2. So it's not talking about marriage. It's talking about something new, which is this relationship between Jesus and the body of of Christ, and that's how Paul concludes. He says, "But I'm speak concerning Christ and the church." What he's talking about here is this relationship between Jesus as the head of the body and the body, which is composed of every every believer. And so, the focus here is on the fact that love and headship go together. Now, in Colossians two eighteen and nineteen, I put Colossians two eighteen up there because of the way verse nineteen starts. It's kind of a negative uh, thrust there, so if you don't get the context, you can't understand it. So, Paul warns the Colossians: Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, and intruding into those things which he has not seen, puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast. See, we are to hold fast, and so the context here is saying: Don't let someone deceive you to not hold fast to the what to the head, to the authority that we are to hold on to Jesus as our authority, as our head, from whom, what? All the body nourished and knit together. Different words now. The word for nourish means, is the Greek word epikrgeo, which means to supply something at one's own expense. That's grace. Jesus does it at his expense. He doesn't say, okay, I'm going to cover the bill, you get the tip. He says, I got the whole thing. I'm covering everything at my expense because you really don't have anything that can contribute. And so the idea of nourishing here is to supply at his expense what's necessary for us to have anything and to have life. So he nourishes us and knits together, sumbibabo, which means to bring things together. If you watch, if you cut yourself and you watch that cut heal, that's something that's being knit together. It's also used of, uh, 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 in, in the womb as the bones and sinews and muscles grow together and develop. Uh, that's the idea of something being knit together here, and that's the body of Christ coming together. And it grows, and it's God that causes the growth and the increase. That's the focus of Colossians 2.19. So back in closing to Colossians 1, verse 18. Christ is the head of the body. That headship isn't just an authority that's telling the church what to do, but it's an authority that tells the church what to do in the in order to nourish it, in order to bring health to the body, in order to bring growth to the body. That means to bring health and growth to each one of us. 
And the purpose of this has to do with the body growing together to maturity so that it is prepared for the future role that God has for it in terms of the kingdom when Jesus comes. Now, what Paul has established here is that Christ is sufficient for all your problems because, first of all, he created everything, he knows everything, and he sustains everything. And secondly, because he is your head as the church, head of the church, and he loves you and wants to solve all those problems, and only he can do it. And so that's his foundation. Now he's going to get into other aspects, starting in verse 19, and we'll come back to that next Sunday morning with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, thank you for this time to study these things, to be reminded that as Christ is our authority, his focus is on our spiritual growth, our spiritual nourishment, our spiritual development, and that he is the one who oversees that process ultimately, and he nourishes and cares for us, that we may grow together and be strengthened within the overall universal body of Christ. Father, we pray that if there's anyone here this morning who's never really studied your word, never really heard the gospel, never really understood that salvation is a free gift, that that would be clear to them. That Jesus did everything necessary on the cross, and all that God asks is that you believe or trust in him and him alone. And at that instant, you have eternal life. And that life can never be taken from you. You are a new creature in Christ, part of his body, and he does not amputate the members of his body. Father, we pray that you would help us to understand, apply these things we study today, and that God the Holy Spirit would uh, open our minds, eyes, that we might clearly understand these things. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.